Today, I'd like to demo dynamic routing in PFSense using OSPF. This will be OSPF v6, i.e. the IPv6 version of OSPF. Um, there already was a good video by NetGate, um, I think in 2018, which I'll link to in the description, that does IPv4, but I wanted to do one for IPv6 as I didn't see that on YouTube yet. In my setup, I have three sites, uh, site A, site B, and site C. Each site has a PFSense router and an Arch Linux box to manage the PFSense router. Um, the PFSense has a WAN interface to the internet, a LAN interface to each site, and, and then OPT1 is going to be for this interconnect, which is basically a, a vSwitch in vSphere. Historically, I guess this could have been MPLS or SD-WAN. Um, maybe today it could often be OpenVPN or IPsec tunnel, but uh, in my case, I'm just using another uh, port group in my vSwitch. Um, as you can see, each site has been given um, uh, an IPv6 network with that site um, code in it to make it easy to identify. And then the interconnect is all in this um, 1000 hex network. And each one of these PFSense routers gets um, its own A, B, or C, etc in that uh, virtual network to make it easy to identify which site we're talking to. So the first step here is to install FRR package and we have to do that for each of the sites. FRR is the package that um, does BGP or OSPF. I think it might even do RIP these days if I'm not mistaken. But um, it doesn't come installed, you have to add it on. So we'll do that for each one of these routers. Oops, should confirm that. And you'll notice that each one of these consoles has a different background color, just that I could tell um, what one I'm connected to. Great, done. Now the next thing that we need to do is allow each one of these sites to talk to each other um, using OSPF6. And to do that, we need to create a rule um, so that the traffic will flow. This is actually multicast traffic. So when we create these rules um, on the OPT1 interface, we have to be pretty flexible about source and destination. You'll see that OSPF actually gets its own IP protocol. So that's what we need to create. And we're not going to put any source or destination. I guess theoretically you could if you knew the uh, specific addresses. That would make this a lot less flexible though. I'm kind of treating this interconnect as a uh, trusted network. All right, so that's it for that. And we'll do the same on site B. And site A as well. Oops. Okay, so now that that's done, we can do basic setup. And the first thing that we need to do is set the global FRR configuration. There really isn't a lot to do here. We just need to turn it on. This is sort of like the master switch and then set a password. And for this, you could generate something or keyboard mash. It does not need to be the same on each site. It, it actually probably should be unique to each location. So I'm just gonna mash a bit on the keyboard. You'd probably wanna do better if you were doing this in production. And just a bit more mashery there. And same thing on site C. Okay, so that's it for the global settings. Now we can do the OSPF uh, six specific ones. So the order here is a little bit funky. What we need to do is set a default area. 
Um, an area is basically just um, a collection of uh, routers that will talk to each other. Um, there's more info in the, the NetGate video if you want to take a look at that. Um, so I, I'm not going to turn this on right now. We're going to add the interfaces first, but before I can add the interfaces, I have to set the default area. So we're going to make that zero, which is kind of a standard um, area if you only have one. And then we're going to add um, an interface. So the interface, the first one I'll add is the router interconnect, which is this OCT1 interface. They all connect um, on OCT1 to the interconnect. And we don't really have to set any other options. In fact, the only other option in this section that we'll use is this passive interface. And we only do that for the LAN interface, which is basically marking it as a um, an announced interface, but not one that we do OSPF on. All right, so then we can save that out and then we'll add the LAN site CLAN. And this one we'll make passive. So we have our interfaces. Okay, finally, now we can go back to the OSPF6 section and enable OSPF6 routing. Now, if you get the order wrong, it's not a big deal. You just need to go back to the global settings. And at the bottom of global settings, you'll see a force service restart. And that's how you can basically recover from that issue. It's really just a GUI issue. It's, it's not uh, probably meant to work that way. Okay, in any case, we'll do that uh, same thing for site B. So that's set the default area to zero and save, and then add both interfaces. So opt is the router interconnect, and site VLAN, which will be a passive interface as it's just going to be announced to the other routers. And then we can come back here and enable OSPF6 and save. All right, same thing for site A. Set the default area. Oops. And save. And then add both interfaces. If you had more interfaces, of course, you could just add them as passive interfaces if you wanted to uh, advertise them to the other routers. And then we can go back to OSPF6 and enable. So at this point, everything should be working routing-wise. And if we go to status and FRR, this is my favorite page because all of the really important stuff shows up, basically all of what you've enabled. And we'll take a look. We don't need to look at this one too much. This is IPv4, so we're not too interested in that. Um, so we can look at the IPv6 ones. And yeah, sure enough, we've got routes in here for A. This is actually the site A um, network that we're on. We also have routes for site B and site C. And these came via the other routers that are advertising these routes. If we look at the neighbors list, um, this might look a little strange. You've got IPv4 in here. This isn't really IPv4 traffic. These are just router IDs. And they just use IPv4 notation as kind of a convenient way to create an ID. And these come from the LAN IDs that are assigned to each router. The other thing that's kind of interesting that I like to look at, if you look at OSPF6, um, uh, whoops, totally in the wrong spot. Um, configuration. This is a pretty neat way to see what you've done and to see whether it actually jives with what you think you should be doing. Um, so in this case we can see both of our interfaces here and the LAN is marked as passive which is good and then these are the ranges that are going to be advertised as routes to the other routers. So again we can see both of our networks 
and this is a shared one, but this is the network that we want to advertise. And so it'll be out, um, they're being advertised, so that's good. Okay, so at this point, routing works. Um, in fact, you can prove that out just by looking at the route list um, from PFSense, not the FRR specific one. And if you look here, you'll see there are routes for A, B, and C. And in fact, this number one here under the flags indicates that that came from OSPF. So, um, now you might think, well, now we could ping things. So we're on site A right now. Let's try to ping the site B router. And no dice. Well, routing works. In fact, we can tell that um, routing works by using trace path. So trace path just kind of hangs here and it's going to say no reply. Um, but if we tried to trace a site that doesn't exist, site D, we get an immediate response saying no way. And that's because um, in this case the route works, but the firewall rule isn't there. So that's the next step that we have to do is create some firewall rules. Now I've already got some things set up here. Um, there are rules for ICMP. Um, outbound from each site. However, there's nothing that would allow inbound ICMP. So even if the remote site receives it, it won't be able to come back. So we need to create some reciprocal rules effectively. Um, so what we'll do is we'll add some rules into the opt one interface, which is where the other sites are going to be uh, coming into. And so we'll add an IPv6 rule for ICMP. We don't care too much about what subtypes. And the source here, ah, what I would like to be able to do is I'd like to be able to write uh, an address that encompasses any site so that I don't have to come back in here if I added site D or E or F. Um, and the way that we can do that is by creating an alias and so we'll create an alias, we'll call it all sites. And all of these sites are slash 64s, and that's you know probably a good convention that I could use is just to keep adding sites within that um, that pool. And that wi winds up being um, this little chunk here, 2001.2.0, is actually a slash 48. So I can create effectively like a summary um, rule or a summary network in this uh, slash 48. And we'll do that on each one of these because we're going to actually use this for each firewall. and site C as well. Oops. Alias first, I always forget that. And that should be the same, yep, yeah, cool. So we'll save that out and apply that. And then we can go and create the rule that we wanted to in the first place. So, ICMP, whoops, I think I just edited this rule, which I don't want to do. Create a new rule. IPv6, OSPF, <laughs> ICMP. <laughs> the source will be all sites, the destination will be LAN nets, which is basically a alias that contains all the LANs. And so here we'll say all sites and all sites uh, IPv6 ICMP. It should be the same Perfect. Okay, so now we have an inbound rule that allows um, all sites to contact our local LANs.
So there, they're all set up that way. Now theoretically ping should work. Yes, so that's ping to the router um, on site B. And this is the Arch Linux box on site B. And we could do the same, um, say on site C to site B. Uh, that's itself. Um, there's site B and there's site A. You can even do the arch box on site A. So this is great, this all works. Um, now, it would be nice if we could also do more than just ICMP. I would really like to see a trace path work because right now, if we actually did that, it wouldn't work. Oops. Um, because trace path uses UDP and we've only allowed ICMP traffic. So it's actually pretty trivial um, to go ahead and add more uh, protocols. So we, we could do that here. We'll add a, a rule for LAN. Um, right now, LAN can already get to trace ports. And again, we just need to add the, the inverse of that. So we'll copy this rule. And instead of ICMP, it's gonna be uh, UDP. And then for the port, we're gonna use our trace ports. And then instead of ICMP, we'll say trace. Cool, so theoretically now, trace path should work. Yes. Yep. And we can even do it to three, which gives us another hop. Three being the uh, Arch Linux box on site A. So that's pretty cool. I think the final test for me would be to check TCP and UDP connectivity. Now I've got really nothing listening on these um, systems. I don't even have SSH running. So what I've done um, I basically written a small um, echo server. So we'll create an alias for that. Oops. And by default, it listens on port 7777, just because port 7 is a privileged port, you need root for that. Um, so this, this avoids having to do that. Okay, so there's the alias created, and we'll create a rule. So we'll allow the traffic out. We might as well just use m say this. We'll copy that. And the protocol here will be TCP and UDP, and the destination will make that all sites. And then we've got this port alias that we could use, we'll call this echo. And so that looks good. And then we'll do the same thing on opt one, where we'll copy this. And, oh, I don't, yeah. Echo. Okay, cool. So that will allow those ports to be used for um, testing. And so we'll do the same thing on the other sites as well. Okay, so all the firewall rules are created. Now I could try um, the echo server 
that I wrote. Um, to test that out, actually, I'm going to want to um, add the netcat package. I only wrote the server part, not the client part. So, and this will be need Python for the server netcat, and I am going to install TCP dump just in case we have to do some troubleshooting. And we'll do the same thing on sites B and C. Okay, so we'll fetch the echo server, which is just a little bit of Python. I wrote, um, looks like B is having a little bit of trouble dealing with getting to the internet, and I don't really feel like troubleshooting that right now. So we are just going to look at sites A and C <laughs> for the moment. And what we'll do is we'll bind to, we're just going to use IPv6. Um, so we're going to bind to the um, local address, um, and that's what the remote side can connect to. And we'll do the same thing here. Great, so now these machines should be able to talk to each other, and I'm just going to fire up another X term. So if I do netcat, on port 7777, this should be a TCP echo server, which is great. That's exactly what I wanted. And if we do the same thing on UDP, it also works. So that's great. And we could do the same thing from the other side Again, just to make sure that this is sort of bi-directional. Um, so site A. Cool. So that's TCP and then UDP. So the upshot of all this is that you could create a new site and drop it into the existing network without making any changes, routing or firewall, to the other sites. So I think that's definitely advantageous compared to static routes, where you'd have to add static routes um, to each of the existing sites. With this method, you don't need to do that. Thanks for watching.